in this field and we also together with other colleagues try to establish links between terrestrial populations and the aquatic communities, although I will not talk about this today. So other than, well, it's a question whether you would even consider myself an ecotoxicologist, but other than many people, I mainly work with field studies, so we have done that in the past, so that's some impressions. We have a current study in, in Morocco on salinization of freshwater systems and here in Romania on pesticide effects. We also work with experiments in the field. That's an example where we look at food webs and how the aquatic subsidies, so the input of aquatic insects, changes these terrestrial food webs. And of course, then our interest is what happens if a stressor influences the aquatic emergence from, and, and how does do these effects or do these effects propagate to terrestrial food webs? These are questions that we explore. Besides working in the field, um, as you can see, it's sometimes rainy, so you need alternatives, and that's modeling. So we also use geostatistical models or statistical models to make large-scale inference of the occurrence of stressors. So that's a study where we looked at the occurrence of chemical risks in European catchments. And recently, we published a paper on world wastewater treatment plants. We are also doing this for ecological modeling. So that's a PhD student who's working on the dispersal over landscapes, not so much stress-related, but generally in terms of climate change, you need to know how species disperse or do they adapt, what's their plasticity, and that's something we try to predict using network models. Okay, so far about my background, so I think that gives you a little bit idea, an idea where I'm coming from, so more from the ecological side perhaps. Today I'm talking about mixtures first. Um, we'll present some models that you probably already know, I'm pretty sure, and meta-analysis, and try to relate these a little bit to the field situation. And then I will do a similar, we'll make a similar approach to the multiple stressors and discuss how to choose null models for multiple stressor research and finally try to relate these two topics a little bit to management and risk assessment. So I start very basic. I mean, you're all aware of that. So we have an uh, occurrence of chemical mixtures, and the question arises, what, or how can we predict the response to joint exposure if you have this huge amount of chemicals that enter the environment? These are, this is also happening in agricultural streams where you're not having these many different chemical groups, but you're having a whole range of pesticides. That's for an, a suite of pesticides that's commonly found in U.S. agricultural streams, and pesticides are also the compound group that I work, worked with a lot in the past. If you want to predict the effect of a mixture, this is from Beata Escher, um, a flow chart, then it has, re has been relatively well established that this depends on the mode of action of compounds, so whether they affect the same target site in an organism and has the same mode of action, then you, then you rather, rather use the concentration addition approach, otherwise the independent action approach is more suitable, and if these compounds somehow interact, for example, one level influences the level of the other compound, then there is potential for synergistic or antagonistic effects. I think that's pretty common to all of you, just to give the framework a little bit, and two common models that I just mentioned, the concentration addition approach and the independent action approach. I'm pretty sure you have seen the formula before. This is um, for the concentration addition approach. You basically benchmark oh, the concentration the of a chemical by a toxicity value. You can do this as, as the sum, um, as the su and you sum that up. And then in independent action, you use the, the observed 
effects here, the, the effects of the different concentrations, and they are the, you build the product of these. But I'm not going more into the math. This is just to remind you, I guess, that more or less since you, you will all be familiar with these models. So the question is, how predictive are those? And this is a paper of Belden when they are, where they are looked at pesticides and they showed that basically this is a concentration addition they used and what they found was that for most, in most cases, so what you see here on the x-axis is the model deviation ratio, how much the, so you divide the observed by the predicted toxicity value that means that a value higher than one would mean um, that you underestimate the effect, so the effect is more severe in reality. And what you see that basically within this window of 50% of, um, to a factor of two, the model predictions are very well. So you can say that these that these mixtures of pesticides, and that's actually not a big difference between pesticides with the same mode of action and those um, with a different mode of action, generally with concentration addition, you reasonably well predict the effects of the pesticide mixture. The similar, a similar storyline is here for a uh, cedar green paper from 2014 where they looked how often antagony, antagonism, synergism and additivity, so that's mainly the, basically the same thing, occurs for pesticides, um, metals and antifoulins. And they also found that generally the models are reasonably well in their prediction. There are cases where prediction, and I focus here on the organic toxicants on pesticides, where the prediction is underestimating the effects of the observed synergy. And two cases where this is found are, are souls. So stereol, these are from the mode of action, sterol biosynthesis inhibitors. This is a, uh, the group of fungicides. And on the other side, some, side, some, some um, when they occur together with organophosphates or carbamides that inhibit the choline esterase. So you could generally say, well, our mixture models are suitable to predict binary mixtures, except for a few compound groups where we know more or less, for example, that this inhibition of some enzymes prevents the, decomp uh, the degradation of these organophosphates or carbamates, these, organo, um, these uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, and so we know more or less the mode of action, why there is synergism occurring. And um, yeah, we know that this occurs for a couple of compounds, so we could ask the question, how frequently do these compounds that cause synergism actually occur jointly in the environment? Because if we want to be predictive, then we need to know what's happening in the environment. And then we could ask the question as well, well, most of these studies were for binary mixtures, but what's the size of real mixtures? And would this change the picture? And here I'm presenting a couple of studies from the field situation. The first one is on the occurrence of assaults, that this is one of the groups that causes synergism, and this is a global analysis of fungicide concentrations found in surface water bodies. What you see here, we, we analyze the occurrence of about 1,000 fungicide concentrations, and our souls are generally one of the most important group of fungicides. So they are often occurring. So you would say, well, in terms of occurrence, they are certainly relevant. A similar picture is 
painted, if we look in, the, in this study that was last year published by Wipke Bush and some, some collaborators from on three central, central, central European rivers, I think the Elbe, Rhine, and Danube, where they assigned to the different compounds that they found, they tried to assign modes of actions, because remember, you need to know the mode of actions to tell something about your predictive capacity, or to be predictive, you need to do this. First of all, you see here that of the roughly 420 compounds found, 35% they couldn't assign a mode of action. That means we are not really sure what's, what's the mode of action, so there is some scope for surprises because we don't know whether they will act synergistic or will cause through some physiological and bi biochemical pathways that will lead to synergism. For those where, we, where they could assign a mode of action, you can see here that sterile biosynthesis inhibition, that's actually fungicides. They make up 4% and neuroactive compounds, so they they occur together at least in these large water bodies. So you can take from this, well, it's probably rather usual case that these compound groups that will cause synergism co-occur in the environment. What we did was we analyzed the governmental pesticide sampling data from about four and a half thousand sites, about 60,000 samples, and that was from the Netherlands, parts of Germany, France, and the US. So also there's, of course, some autocorrelation or it's not well scattered, the monitoring programs. We analyzed this data, and I'm not going into all the technical details. If you want to be, uh, want to make representative assessments, for, for, for example, for the US, you need to run algorithms before to have um, a representative cover of the US. So here's a clear, if you would analyze the data as that, you would mainly say something about central US, which you don't want to do. So there are algorithms to do this, so it's often some pre-processing involved. What we found was after all this pre-processing, I'm not going into details there, is that first of all, what these different regions or countries, the compounds they analyze, that differs very strongly. So you see here, that's a barcode plot, and what you see here is each of these lines represents a compound. If you see a line here and you find that line somewhere here, that means they analyze the same compound. and what you see is more or less that the Netherlands cover more or less everything of these different compounds except for a few, but that the spectra of compounds vary a lot between countries, so that means comparison between countries are difficult. And you see that this is even for Germany as well. If you, if you compare Baden-Württemberg, which is in the south, in the far southwest, and Rhinal palatinite, which is in the southwest, you see that even the spectra they analyze don't match very well. So that's also something to take into account if you analyze monitoring data that these not necessarily match. So that's to be taken into account when comparing the results. When we look at the, when we look at the results, we see what's the size of mixtures. That's only pesticides mixtures here. We see that the size consists that they typically consist of four to seven compounds, irrespective of where we are looking. So that means in the the samples from the U.S. were a little bit lower, but for France, Netherlands, Rhineland Palatinate, uh, so the different German states, we found between four and seven different, or they found between four and seven compounds in the mixtures. However, it's pretty clear that this is a strong underestimation because, first of all, I showed you before that not all of the compounds are measured everywhere. 
the programs differ quite a bit between the countries. And in a study, this is a study here by Moshet et al., they compared a comprehensive pesticide screening where they monitored several streams and used an advanced chemical analysis for many compounds and their metabolites and compared the results to the typical way that the Swiss monitoring and international uh, to, the, 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 to the Swiss monitoring results and international study results and if you would just focus on the water framework directive, the pesticides that are included in the water framework directive. And what you see is clearly that they found on an average about 40 different pesticides in a sample with classical, with the classical monitoring you would only find a little uh, about 15 and if you only focus on the water framework directive and that's, that may actually be the case in the studies I presented you before for Germany they are driven by water framework directive then you conclude that there are about five different substances in the samples. So you see although five the mixture of five is, is uh, generally or it was, was generally found that's probably a huge underestimation of the amount of pesticides that you typically find and pesticides are certainly the compound group where we know that they are bioactive, they are built to harm organisms. A similar conclusion was found in our study where we related the number of analyzed compounds to the number of detected compounds and this is a, some kind of a fancy correlation chart so it's given the many or the, the high, the, the large number, the large sample size when, when you see red fields, red means it's a higher density of samples and you basically see that the red somehow moves up here so it's a positive correlation between the number of analyzed compounds and the number of detected compounds. The more you analyze, the more you find, that's somehow trivial but that needs to be taken into account if you make conclusions based on governmental monitoring data. So the mixture sizes are still most likely underestimated. So on the one hand they are, it is influenced by the number of analyzed compounds but it's also influenced by the sampling time, particularly that's probably not so much for, if we make the picture a bit broader again, for point source input like the picture I showed you in the very beginning on wastewater treatment plants, many of the consumer product chemicals or pharmaceuticals they will enter more or less continuously but for pesticides we know actually that precipitation that causes runoff or drainage flows and this leads to episodic, episodic input events into the streams. And if you don't catch these episodic input events, many studies have shown that, then you get a completely wrong picture of your exposure in the environment. And if we now look into the monitoring programs, the governmental monitoring programs, how often they take samples after rain events. So we, we took the German weather data and we related the sampling events to the rain on the day or the previous day. We also have some statistics for that, but I'm also showing you only showing you this, this figure here. You can already see that 95% of the samples are taken when there is no rain. I mean, I'm not saying that the operators just go out when there is nice weather. That's not my message here. But you can clearly, maybe it also rains, not that often in Germany. Um, but um, it's, it's clearly the case that very, very few samples have been taken after rain events. And that means if you, if you, 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 you at least dilute the findings that you have. If you then read some headlines, there was, there was, it was more not in a peer-reviewed paper but a discussion in Germany where somebody published a paper and said that 90-95% of samples we don't find any pesticides, everything is good in Germany. 
Well, then you have to put this into perspective, of course, if you sample most of the time in periods where you don't expect something, that's no wonder. And for an organism, it doesn't matter whether it's 99% of the year alive. If it's 1% of the year dead, then that's sufficient for the ecological quality. So to conclude a little bit on, on this, um, the compound groups and mode of actions that show synergism and that cause some troubles for predicting joint effects, they occur relatively frequently or co-occur relatively frequently. The mixture size in streams and rivers is much higher than in the typical experiments. So the question arises, should we worry about synergistic effects from mixtures? The picture I portrayed you so far is probably we have an issue here and yeah, in the following I want to dwell a little bit on that. So a study that we did a couple of years ago was we looked at different predictions of effects from pesticides. We took data from five field studies that was not only pesticides, was also studied with generally organic toxicants. And we looked at invertebrate communities. And we calculated different mixture metrics and then correlated these mixture metrics with ecological metrics. As a background to these field studies, I have to say these were field studies that were designed to somehow capture toxicant or pesticide effects. And if you would analyze these studies with multivariate statistical methods or with, with um, model selection techniques, typically, or in most, more or less every of these studies, the pesticide toxicity or toxicant or, or organic toxicant um, toxicity popped up as one of the main determinants of the communities there. So uh, we can be sure that these were not just random studies, but are studies where toxicants seem to be important. So these studies, from our perspective, say, seem them suitable to confront the community changes with different metrics of, for summing up the exposure. So we calculated a couple of different metrics. Um, here you see, again, two models that you have already heard this morning are pretty aware of. That's the concentration addition model. So we summed up toxic units. The independent action was calculated for the communities using species sensitivity distributions, and then the, um, the multi-substance potentially effect, uh, affected fraction approach. Not going into these technical details here. For this paper, you find the whole R code and all the material we put online, so you can look in, in how we did this technically. Um, and you could easily do the same calculations with your data if you wanted to. And as a third model, we used dominance. That means we just focus on the most severe toxicants in each of the samples. There are differences here. We, for benchmarking the toxicity, on the, we, we used on the one hand Daphnia magna. On the other hand, also the most sensitive to test organism that was available. You will later see that the results are not that different. We have to put this a little bit into hyphens because for 60% of the organisms, we only had data for Daphnia magna. So that's a little bit skewed comparison. So for, for overall in these studies, we had about 110 pesticides. And for 60, if I remember correctly, we only had toxicity data for Daphnia magna for invertebrates. Of course, there are algae data and fish data, but don't mix up groups of organisms if you do something like that. So what did we find? And generally found that we could explain in the studies of the ecological metrics that are designed to capture, this, this is the SPEAR index, 
some trade-based index tailored to detect pesticide effects. And the best models explained between 70 and 90 percent of the variance. So that's a quite a good or close correlation. And concentration addition approach was generally worked best, followed by dominance and then by independent action. Interestingly, the data set where we had different organic toxicants, so not only pesticide, but a wide range of toxicants, there the independent action approach worked best. So for the four pesticide data sets, the concentration addition approach worked best. For the fifth one, with generally organic toxicants, the independent action approach. Whether this is a pattern that can be concluded um, or tells us something uh, or can be generalized, I think more analysis would be needed. Um, but data sets where you have really good measurements of chemicals and of the ecological situation are not that um, widely available. However, also the, the concentration addition approach and the dominance approach the differences were rather subtle. They were not that big. So generally, concentration addition was better, but it explained only about 1 to 3 percent more variance of this 70 to 90 percent. So you could conclude, well, if you just stick to the most toxic compound, that also tells you something about what's going on. So few toxicants drive the effect. And since I'm in Sweden, I checked, and you also have a study done in Sweden, which comes more or less to the same conclusion. I think Thomas was involved in it, and oh, it was your study, fantastic. So at least one person um, has some <laughs> sympathy for me now. Um, yeah, that matches very well with that study that very few toxicants drive the risk. But since, since they differ between all of the sites, and that's also something you can generalize from many studies that we have done, but also the colleagues in Switzerland and you here. Um, it, it does not allow to reduce the amount of chemicals to measure in the environment to a small amount, since it differs between the sites. Well, the question from, I mean, that's just a single study, and you should never build too more, never rely too much on a single study, but if you ask yourself, well, why are mixtures not that more important? Before I showed you that you have these fungicides occurring with the insecticides that's causing synergism, and probably that's very widely occurring. Shouldn't we be more worried in terms of predicting effects that there are strong ecological surprises that we can expect? Well. Why don't we see that? One reason might be that the concentrations are lower than in the experiments. That's at least, at least an, an explanation that is given in, in Cedar Green, where she showed that typically the, the concentration levels where you see interactions are lower um, in, in the environment are uh, sometimes lower. That can be an explanation. A more important explanation is probably, if you remember what we looked at in the previous study, we looked at community level data. I, told, um, I was telling you we were looking at ecological metrics. Those were built from ecological communities. And if you think about what's going on in communities, communities have no mode of action. Only individuals can have mode of action. And these modes of action differ between the different organisms. And that means that you typically have some buffering in communities. If you, and that's actually shown, that some leads us to multiple stressor research. If you look into multiple stressor research where stressors with different stressor mode of actions affect different levels of biological organization. You see here the physiological level. You see here individual and population level, here community and ecosystem level. And this is an, 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 a summary of different multiple stressor 
study, so a, a meta-analysis of meta-analysis, meta-meta-analysis, and you see these lines here that connect to synergy, additivity, and antagonism, and you see then from the physiological box you have lines to synergy from individual and population level as well from the community and ecosystem level you don't see any lines. So that basically tells us before if we look at the community or ecosystem level we cannot expect to see a lot of synergy there. If we are interested in populations, for example we want to protect the a certain dragonfly because of conservation purpose or whatever, then we might see much more synergy. Uh, that's the population level or the individual level. We certainly see much more of that if we are just interact, interested from our protection goal in the community and ecosystem level. We probably don't have to worry that much about the synergism. Okay, and this first slide from multiple stressor research leads to my second topic that's multiple to show you how this or that what we, what's going on multiple stressor research and how we can bring this somehow together. First of all, as an introduction here, a reminder that in the freshwater realm we have about the strongest loss of biodiversity at least among the strongest if you see the decline in terrestrial biodiversity compared to the freshwater biodiversity, the decline is somewhat stronger, that's the, but that's from the WWF. There are other um, analyzers that come more or less to the same conclusion. And if we look at the stressors that are responsible for this decline in aquatic, habitat, in aquatic ecosystems, that's largely habitat loss and degradation, and but followed directly by pollution, exploitation, invasive species, and so on, climate change, rather small component currently. So these are different stressors that affect these ecosystems. So what we asked ourselves, well, how often do these stressors actually co-occur in a typical river? And we looked for Germany, we looked at habitat degradation, so that's for medium to large rivers in Germany, that's the, la uh, that's the map of um, structural quality for Germany. You see it's mainly red and orange, that means it's not that fantastic. And other stressors we looked at was the occurrence of invasive species. We also used some invasiveness category system, whether the invasion status is problematic or where, whether they are just occurring but not cause any problems. Eutrophication, so excessive nutrients, and we looked at the occurrence of organic, um, organic toxicants. And of course they all co-occur, but the question that we, or what we discussed just before is, it's, it's a question of course of the level. At what level do they co-occur? So we, we checked how often these different stressors occur above thresholds that cause concern, that we may see ecological impacts. And we use these thresholds from previous studies and regulation as long as the regulation was, was um, reasonably backed up by scientific evidence and use monitoring data from the water framework monitoring so the sites are considered representative for the catchments in Germany from the years 2006 to 2010. What we found was if you look this is the, the risk classes NR means no risks, um, LR is low risk, HR is high risk for the four different groups of stressors. We can see that definitely nutrients cause much concern in most of the sites and habitat degradation. So both indeed affect in, uh, almost 80% of the sites 
habitat degradation at high risk, um, almost 30 per 40%. Uh, nevertheless, organic toxicants also occur about, uh, above low risk threshold in 40% of the sites and invasive species at 50% of the sites. If you relate this to a site, that's the number of stressors that we see in a site, then we can clearly say it probably doesn't make much sense to only look at a single stressor. So, we are, so even mixtures we have in addition to that, of course, when I said organic toxicants, that means all kinds of organic toxicants. I think that was about 150 or something that were measured in these studies. So they are co-occurring with several other stressors typically. Um, yeah, in 80%, 85% of cases you have three or four stressors co-occurring. And that matches reasonably well, and I mean we just focused on these four, so we couldn't find much more. If you take a little bit the broader picture, that's the marine ecosystems, uh, marine ecosystem, and you see, and they looked at up to 15 stressors. That's in, in, in purple here, from, from white to purple, and you can see you only have no stress in the marine system if you are on continents. Well, <laughs> that's not particularly helpful for the marine organisms, I guess. Um, but yeah, generally you have also about between five to 10, but here in Southeast Asia, um, you have up to 15 stressors along the coast of Australia, along the coast particularly have um, quite many stressors co-occurring. So multiple stressors are generally the rule also in the um, marine ecosystem. So what does this mean for the stressors? What is the response to stressors? This is a study that was also just published last year where they took governmental monitoring data from about 1,000 sites they looked at the response of about 20 ecological metrics to 12 different stressors. How did they respond? And what they found was that there were very few significant interactions. That's, that's just the share here of, of um, variance that is explained by different factors, so you have here um, a light gray total nitrogen. You see it in, 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 um, in black riparian land use, um, physical habitat quality, and you see that in most, uh, particularly for benthic invertebrates, land use and physical habitat quality as, as well as for um, fish plays the major role. Other natural factors also explain part of this. Generally, if they looked at interactions between these different stressors, they didn't explain much of the variance. So, for example, interaction between nutrients and physical habitat. The only um, case where this was observed was for land use with some habitat characteristics. And a similar conclusion was drawn from a, from a different stressors. These were 125 streams observed in Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and Sweden. And they looked at the co-occurrence of stressors. So this is a, another fancy plot, but um, it's, not, it's actually not that difficult to understand. You have connections between the different stressors and the thicker the lines are, the, most, the more they are co-occurring. So do you see that fine sediments are typically occurring together with orthophosphate and in urban areas and when you have cropland. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically what you can from tell from this and in 20, only in 20% of cases they found non-additive interactions. 
So again, additivity, like think back about the case of chemical mixtures, also additivity works reasonably well in explaining the effects that, that can be observed. Um, Non-additive interactions were mainly for fine sediment with orthophosphate. So when they occur together, they could observe some, could observe some elevated effects or non-predicted effect, uh, predicts not effects not predicted from the two stressors. Well, in a meta-analysis, if we confront this with a meta-analysis um, that has been published in Global Change Biology, again, um, it's, it's not so much a matter of the details of this figure. What is shown here are different stressor combinations. So C is chemicals, um, N nutrients, um, W is warming and so on. What you generally see in these bars is black is the additive effect, gray is antagonistic, and white is synergism. And what you observe is that here somehow, if we look, take a broader picture, additivity don't, doesn't seem to work. Somehow the black bars, if you want to predict the total amount of studies you see, you only you only have um, up to 30% additivity. In many other studies, you have synergism or antagonism or even reversal, which means the effect takes the opposite direction than ex expected. When I saw this study, I asked myself, well, that's somehow odd. Why is this the case? Because that basically, if you think about what we should do as scientists, be predictive, that means we can't predict much. If we are asked what happens if we put these stressors, if these stressors co-occur, what happens in the ecological system, we can say, well, in 20% of cases we can predict it, in the other 80% we can't. We don't really know what's going on. Well, this meta-analysis I showed you before of Cote somehow also showed that the picture is very, uh, is very confusing. And in these individual meta-analysis, all kinds of different stressors, they found between 4% and 70% synergies. Again, if you want to predict something now, do we have a big problem? If, if it's just 4% synergy, you would say, well, we are reasonably fine with our additivity prediction, and if we have 70%, we're definitely not very well. Unfortunately, there were few consistent responses, so you can't really say is synergy mainly occurring in this type of ecosystem, so that's a mixture of marine, aquatic, terrestrial ecosystem, all kinds of different stressors, all kinds of organisms, but there's no clear pattern. We can't say, well, it's mainly occurring in invertebrates, it's mainly occurring in the marine system, and so on. There's few consistent response, except for the one that I showed you, that we typically have no synergism on the community or ecosystem level. And if we look at the publication situation, you see that somehow the number of pipers of synergism is more or less exploding. And that should also may caution ourselves against maybe it's easier to publish something about synergy than about something else, at least in some journals. Well, we have to take a step back and actually ask ourselves, how do we actually determine what is synergism and antagonism? I, have, I didn't show you that far. I showed you for chemical mixtures that you have this model deviation ratio and we rank between if it's within the boundary of 50% to, to the factor of 2, then it was seemed appropriate. How do, did these authors do this in ecological studies? And here I show you the null models that are typically used in, were typically used in these ecological studies. And these are, different, these are different null models. The dominance you've already heard, that's just the dominance stressor. Uh, 
additivity, that just means summing up stressor A and B, and then you have the multiplicative model. The multiplicative model is the independent action model in ecotoxicology. We can actually relate this um, mathematically to each other. And depending on what you choose here, you evaluate that your interaction is synergistic or antagonistic. That means if you take an additive null model, something that you consider antagonistic would be synergistic for a multiplicative null model. And also the question is, what are the boundaries that you use under which you still deem a model as acceptable? Well, if we look then what, how people dealt with that in multiple stressor research, and most of the times the additive null model was taken, but not necessarily consciously, but because they use an ANOVA approach. And when you use the ANOVA, first of all, deviation from additivity is then driven by statistical power, by the power of your study, and that should probably not be. And on the other hand, you're not aware of, of what you are doing. And that actually is shown, Griffin et al. made a reanalysis of marine studies and found that in one third of the studies, at least 30% of the authors, they were not aware that they actually use a different null model when they log transform their response. If you move from through a log transformation of your response variable, you move to a multiplicative null model. I'm not going to the mathematical background of that, but at least 30% were not aware of that, and that actually means in such a meta-analysis, you throw together all kinds of different null models that are used, and the null models have not been motivated by some conceptual choice, but rather by st use of statistics and hunting for statistical significance. So interactions are largely diagnosed on statistical significance, not effect size, and that's something that multiple stressor research can certainly learn from ecotoxicology. Well, and we thought a little bit more about this issue. It's a paper that will come out soon. What should actually be considered when you deal with these different stressors? Well, first of all, we should think about the stressor mode of action. How does it affect the organism? Is it a physical force? It's a, is it a specific or non-specific physiological effect? So, and then you can try, as an ecotoxicology, try to evaluate. Is it a similar or different mode of, mode of action? Then sensitivity, what's the relationship between sensitivities? And here just a small termino terminological and conceptual diagram. So sensitivity, um, of course, is, is beside the stressor level a determinant of the effect. And if we look at the relationship between sensitivities. You have one case here. Um, so the same individuals here are in the same position in the, in the second plot. If sensitivities are negatively correlated, that means for, stre for a stressor A, the individuals that would be affected are different than for the stressor B. And if, the, if you have this case, then overall you have additivity. But if you have in the environment organisms that are generally sensitive towards multiple stressors, which is the case here, so you have a positive correlation for sensitivities, then it's actually clear that the sum of both stressors is not leading in this case to a higher mortality, but you could also do this for growth or other endpoints. So that's something to take into account. So in the first case, the additive null model seems appropriate. In this case, you probably are fine with the dominance null model. So that's something to think about before you use a null model. Well, if we look then into the field situation, what is 
the sensitivity correlations and that's for community level data and it's um, from a study from Schubert et al. What they did was they used field samples and looked at the sensitivity of organisms towards temperature and towards pesticides and what they found was that for temperature pH and that's I think the subrobic index um, you saw a relatively high correlation of the response of the communities to both stressors that, that means on the other hand that the organisms are somehow similarly um, sensitive and that's the same was when you uh, they showed um, that if you have a larger taxon pool so you put more organisms inside the taxon pool that these sensitivities are lower but generally we can expect some correlation between sensitivities and that's not too surprising. Um, we also have strong correlations between traits. So these traits are properties of organisms um, and these, these, these maps are um, self or this, this is, these are some so self-organizing maps. Um, whenever you see one of these, one of these fields um, having the same color, that means there is some correlation. So that means that and that's multivariate. I'm not going into technical details, but you, what, what you generally see here is that organisms that are strong flyers also um, have a low crawling rate. Um, they are organisms that are um, herbivores, if you look at these fields here, they tend to be, um, to tend to have a good swimming ability and so on. What you generally can take from that is that these are not random patches, but you see patterns here if you look at the different trites. That's just a small amount of the trites and that's somehow clear. We have no random distribution of the trites in the communities. Organisms choose some different life history strategies. So in another paper, Nico Verberg showed that these are about seven, eight, and probably sens general stressor sensitivity to different stressors is also something where you see such correlations. It hasn't been analyzed yet. We're working on something like that, but based on the other traits, we expect that we see a little bit similar pattern. Something else to consider is of course the effect type. What is affected? Is it mortality? Then we rather should use the multiplicative null model. Is it growth? Then perhaps rather the additive. What's the effect size? When you are close to the limit of the effect then obviously you can't have much additivity anymore and dominance should be sufficient. And finally knowledge of stressor effect relationship will allow you to use a broader range of models. What do I mean by that? Well if we look at the standard null models used in the standard null models they just take the effect of A and B that's also what you use for the multiplicative um, and independent action null model. But if you know something about the stressor effect relationship or ecotoxicologically concentration um, response relationship, then you can use the concentration or stressor addition model. It would look generalized for stressor addition as something like that. So you could predict the joint effect by adding up stressor intensities that certainly a model, so this model of concentration addition can be translated to multiple stressor research without that much effort. Well, another model that has recently been introduced um, and for the case of toxicants jointly with other stressors is the so-called stress addition model. So and here we are find this emergence, this um, merging of multiple stressor research and chemical research. 
if you think about the sensitivity, the sensitivity of organisms will have a distribution. So you could have uniform distribution that the sensitivity of all organisms is different and it's just incrementally increasing. You can, have, you can expect in this case it's a Gaussian distribution, so the average most of the organisms have a certain sensitivity and some have a very high sensitivity and others have a very low sensitivity. So now the philosophy of this model is that we are not looking at adding up the, um, the stressor concentrations, but we add up the stress capacities or the tolerance of the organisms and the areas under the curve of the probability distribution. And that's, that's the philosophy of the SAM model. If you do this, and this is just a hypothetical example, so you would add up the stress capacity here that's, that's um, causing 25% each, and then you add that up to about 50%, and that's then the combined stress of both stressors. And we, we evaluated this. Here you see the environmental stress on the x-axis and you see the increase of toxicant sensitivity on the y-axis and that is the stressor addition model here for the LC50 and the LC10. So how that was the LC50 and LC10 under different levels of the environmental stressor and you see that the SAM model was reasonably well predicting the change in the LC50, LC10, whereas if we used an analog analogously the independent action model or the concentration addition model, both didn't work that well. So that means in that case where you have more or less something where you would say, well, we have some kind of syn synergy if we look from the perspective of an independent action by adding another layer of conceptual thinking, which is here, well, we are not just looking at the, at the um, stressor, uh, that the concentration um, response relationship, but at the, pro of, of, at the probability distribution of the, of the sensitivities, we can be predictive without introducing any interaction terms. And I think that's interesting and something perhaps to build on, although one has to say this has been fitted, that's semi empirical so there is some fitting of the empirical distribution behind that that was used for most studies. Um, whether these parameters can be predicted and work for many studies is open to, deba to debate. Uh, there, are, um, there are just too few studies that look at the whole concentration response relationship over different levels of environmental stressors. So that certainly is something um, that can, can, could be used um, if you combine chemicals and other stressors. Well, the question is why have these models been rarely applied in multiple stressor studies at least, or I mean one obvious reason is that it has just been published last year, that's the trivial one. But the other case is if you look at analysis of the designs of studies, 85% of the studies that was on fish and Griffin and I was on marine ecosystems they employ a factorial design where they have just two or three levels of one stressor. So then it's very, very difficult to, be, to, to move into a regression design and to say anything else um, than for the specific level. However, I also want to show you something where ecotoxicologists could learn, and that's that you can integrate null models with ecological processes. What we have considered so far, or what most of the ecological models, or the, the models in, in the ecotoxicological models work on, um, 
is on individuals. So you don't need to consider much ecological processes there. But what interests us basically is the field situation. And let's say we are not only interested in communities where we know or okay, care, we don't need to be bothered that much about potential synergism, but we want to be predictive for individuals or populations, then we need to take into account that population dynamics is important for the joint effect of stressors. And that's shown here. You have here the additive effect that's always given by the gray box. You have the individual effects in blue and yellow and the real effect that is observed um, in the red dashed line. And what you see is that depending on the per capita, per capita production um, related to the density, so how strong the density dependence is of the population growth, that the realized effect can be much, much um, higher or much, much lower um, than the additive effect. Yeah? That's the story or that's the main message here. The density dependence certainly in real populations influences the effect of two stressors and that would also hold for two chemicals. And if we want to be predictive for the field situation, that's something to be considered. And another example of for such an integration is the model of that's, that's also in press. I think, yeah, that's, yeah, it's not published yet by Thompson et al. It will occur, uh, will be published in a couple of weeks, where they looked at in how additive effects play out in the community dynamics for different sensitivity correlations and for different effect directions. So here both effects were negative, here one was positive, one was negative. And they have the so-called compositional mo null model. It's the null model they developed in, in green and in black. It's the joint effect. Um, multiplicative null model, so independent action in blue and additive in red. We're not going through all of these graphs, but you, what you can basically take here, if you look at the green line and the black line, you see that in most cases, the green and black line are reasonably well overlapping, whereas the red and the blue line are quite off from the black line. So that shows you on the community level to be predictive. Um, also, we can integrate the null models um, via these ecological dynamics. Well, to sum up, what are similarities with mixture research? I think that generally have a, con, 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 um, con, a, a small number of stressors and chemicals that drive the responses that we saw. That's what we saw from the field studies that actually for an ecological metrics of communities, at least, it's a small amount of stressors or chemicals that drive the response. Um, the, the research situation in the labo that, that's um, relying on or focusing on experiments basically looks at binary mixtures and stressors. We have similarities in the mechanistic background that could be brought together. And what multiple stressor research can learn is that there are further null models. And maybe if we use different Null models, they also would have a much higher fraction of additive effects that the mechanistic basic for basics for ecotoxicology and this multiple stressor research is, is similar. Um, and that setting model deviation ratios as in ecotoxicology could be helpful. On the other hand, what mixture research can learn is that integration with ecological models um, could be beneficial 
for prediction. Well, I'm already quite over time. Um, I promise you the last block which we now enter will be very short because I'm not that an applied scientist so I can't say that much to risk assessment and management about what I want to at least end with a couple of thoughts in this direction. Well, if we look into current risk assessment, we, can, we could provocatively say, well, it somehow fails. Because if you just look in a couple of relatively high-ranking pipers in the last years, um, then we have this pesticides reduce regional biodiversity of stream invertebrates that's opposing what um, is in the, in the pesticide use directive of the, in European Union that biodiversity should not be affected. You have this effect of pollinators, um, the Rundloff paper, nice studies, and here you have the question whether terrestrial pesticide exposure um, contributes to the global decline in amphibians. So could put uh, many more of such studies that have occurred in the last five to ten years um, somehow gives you the impression that it's not working particularly well. Well, if you think about what's neglected in risk assessment, this is somehow the landscape context, and we should probably not, it's probably not, the, the term landscape context is probably misleading, should be landscape and management context, so what's done in this, land, in this landscape, and while well, it's not the landscape, it's scale. And that leads to multiple stressors, including chemical mixtures, to climate, we have a different climates, habitat types, the connectivity can be different, and ecological processes uh, play, of course, a role. And that's from a recent Ovaska in paper. When we look at the processes that drive the species pool, so we are thinking here about biodiversity, what, are, what is the species pool, species pool that we have, then environmental filtering is one aspect. Now here we are not even considering all environmental filters, yeah, just what we mentioned before, multiple stressors are not completely considered, chemical mixtures. Um, but we are also ignoring more or less ecological interactions and we have dispersal that is not considered between in these, in these models. That's partly um, also stochasticity is, is not considered um, and these drive the community responses. So how could we integrate this into risk assessment? Well, on the one hand, you could say you just take higher safety factors. Uh, there are some studies that su suggest some safety factors. If you consider multiple stressors, you, can, you consider the chemical and additional stressors, and then you, then you add a couple uh, uh, smaller, uh, higher safety factors. However, a paper of Steele and Schulz 2015 from our institute showed that already insecticides, two thirds would fail or fail tier one. They could not be authorized on a tier one. And if you think about the chemical authorization system that's based on an unless clause, the unless clause say it should not be authorized unless you can show with more complex systems that it's safe. Uh, that's the philosophy of the system. So adding stronger safety factors would just mean that all of these compounds need to be legislated via the unless clause, but somehow they are legislated in the end nevertheless, or authorized nevertheless. So it's probably not particularly helpful. Maybe we need a new risk assessment paradigm, and how could this look like? These are basically not my conclusions, um, or not, not only my conclusions, let's put it like that. This is uh, based on a discussion uh, with uh, 
several colleagues. We have um, we will release uh, um, an opinion paper for the German Science Foundation or for the German Academy of Sciences, the Leopoldina. They invited 15 experts in uh, pesticide risk assessment to put an opinion piece together. It will be published in next weeks. And what we said wa was. Well, what we probably need is a more spatially explicit risk assessment that considers real landscapes and allows for real world validation. I mean, uh, even a mesocosm cannot be revalidated against a real stream situation. The same holds for, uh, we, we were do doing a, germ, uh, a study for the German EPA where we were looking at the focus scenarios and those scenarios, this, the, these streams that are used in focus, they are more or less not occurring in the landscape with these size, one meter wide or 70 centimeter deep or whatever. Um, what we thought is, well, maybe we can have some supervised limited authorization in, in real landscapes. So, we already have some catchments with demonstration farms in Germany. We could use some catchments where we have trials as in the medical sciences where we authorize chem uh, medical um, substances and look what's happening. We need to think more about cross compliance, for example, with the water framework directive. What's the level of ecological quality we need to achieve? I think some ideas from, these are actually ideas from some regulatory bodies in Sweden. Um, I forgot the name of your regulatory body, but I discussed with them and they suggested to have a comparative assessment, so to only authorize the benefit analysis to see under which conditions the benefits, um, the, the yield benefits exceed the environmental costs. And just to give you an impression what we are thinking about, uh, what kind of examples here, I'm coming from an institute within the biggest German wine producing region. And a lot of herbicides are sprayed there, and these herbicides are not sprayed because the, these, um, because the herbs would be a pest for the wine. That is not the problem. But it's easier to kill the herbs um, through spraying than to mow it. Well, that's why you use these toxic substances there. So, and these are probably cases where you would say, um, well, the environmental costs may be higher than uh, the, the uh, yield benefits. Huh? That's examples where we are, we are thinking of. Okay, what can be done under the status quo in the risk assessment? Well, you can identify the dominant stressor and chemical when you have abiotic and biotic data from monitoring or modeling and ecological thresholds and then to alleviate the situation focus on the dominant stressors and chemicals. And I would say, and there are tools for multiple stressors from the uh, European Mars project, that's the website, the Freshwater Information Platform, just released a couple of weeks ago. And for freshwater ecosystems, I would actually argue, well, if you would want to get rid of most stressors and problems, just let's have forested buffer strips around all stream systems that will deal with the issue of climate change, that will reduce the inflow, the input of, of runoff with chemicals, and this will reduce the input of nutrients and so on. So finally, I come to my take home messages. Generally, our models are reasonably successful in predicting binary mixture effects, but they need integration with ecological models. Null models, null models for multiple stressor research should be selected based on mechanistic understanding. And 
I, I think that integration of multiple stressor and mixture re research would benefit both and I'm alluding um, to a piper that um, Thomas yesterday said, well, that's very old wine. Um, it, it's, in, it's indeed 15 years old. Now it's ecotoxicology becomes stress ecology. Whether ecotoxicology needs to become stress ecology or stress ecology needs to become ecotoxicology, I leave that open. <laughs> and yes, I thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, of course, um, my PhD students and postdocs were uh, involved in many of these studies, and I, th I thank you. Um, I, w I was told I should give about 60 to 90 minutes. Um, I'm almost at the border boundary of 90. I hope you are not too exhausted now and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.